How are you all doing today? I was having too much fun out there. Give me a moment. Ah. It's a beautiful Sunday morning, isn't it? I think it's a wonderful Sunday morning. And for, for me, this has been the perfect winter so far. Not too cold and no snow, right? You're all with me. Woo! There's always one who doesn't know what they're talking about back there. I think that sounded like Dale, but I'm not no, sure. Uh, <laughs> I want to continue. Um, this is the last Sunday, actually, uh, for the series that we've done through January and February. I um, hope you have been reading the book. Actually, again, uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback, and a person this morning, this morning said to me that uh, he's been telling people that if you didn't get the book and read it, you need to get the book and read at least the last couple of chapters. And so I, I hope you'll do that. It has been helpful to me, very helpful, in, in not that I've learned a bunch of new stuff, but in how they have refrained. There's a reframing that takes place that helps you see things more clearly or in a new way. Um, and, and that reframing is important for all of us in a lot of issues in order for us to grow in, in our lives. We often have to reframe the way we have understood things in the past in order to move forward in, in the present. And so I, I would encourage you to do that. And I want to thank everyone who has and who has been following along. I want to bring it to a conclusion then this week by um, helping us at least to get one thing out of the way, if nothing else, I hope we can get one thing out of the way. And that is, uh, if we find our, if we uh, get involved in ministry, we'll know it's right because everything will fall in place and it'll be easy. That is probably the deepest lie that I had to jettison from my mind that was handed to me by my tradition, my Sunday school and people who talked about ministry and doing the work of the Lord in whatever area that we do the work of the Lord. Um, it's just not that way. It's just not that way most of the time. And it's not that way biblically either. If you actually look at the, uh, all of the, if you take a study and look at the call, the calls um, of uh, the people in the Bible, it's, it's, it's often excruciating. And uh, from my experience, I want you to know it was entirely excruciating. It was agonizing. From, from the time that I finally quit avoiding the sense of call and actually um, decided to be more serious and move forward, it was an agonizing process of, of stepping out of the comfort area into, um, as I've been calling it, the opaque future. Being able to see a little, but just not being able to see clearly because um, there are very few people who can see real clear in the future. And we're in a real opaque moment now where, where almost no one can see into the future. And so it was just, it was many sleepless nights agonizing over the issue. Uh, I, once I made the issue and, and proclaimed it, I was appointed almost right away because... I had some experience in business, but that was an agonizing process. Uh, I, I enjoyed you know, working in the lumber company. It was a small lumber company. It was no Lowe's, you know. It was a little lumber company in a little town, but I, I enjoyed that very much. I, I enjoy going into Lowe's now and just walk around. Just here, this will sound a little strange, I'm sure. Just to smell the lumber. Oh, there we are, thank you. Um, Walk by the oak um, molding boards. I love the smell. I, I enjoyed being in the lumber company. And making the decision to leave was, was absolutely agonizing. Pointed right away into uh, up here at St. Luke's. And I had two years of college and three years of seminary to do. And so for two years, I drove three days a week to Philadelphia. And um, I don't particularly like driving. Never have. 
uh, I don't know why. People think you're strange if you don't like to drive. I like to be driven. Karen says, do you want me to drive today? I'm in the passenger seat. Um, I just don't, I had to drive three days a week Philadelphia. And you know what I found out? Weather between here in, in this part of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia are rarely the same. Do you know that? A lot of days I drove down there, I left when they had already closed school and for snow, drove in a little Vega, remember those things? Horrible little car, um, down to Philadelphia where it's raining. They haven't canceled college because it's raining down there. Up here, we have closed schools because there's a lot of snow. I don't like driving. I drove two years, three days a week to Philadelphia, and three years, three days a week down to Lancaster. Um, that was not an easy process for me. Seminary. Um, the second year of seminary, I've mentioned before, but I want to mention again, uh, doing what it takes to equip oneself uh, to actually uh, live into the call. Uh, the second year of seminary was the hardest year of my life. It was an exceedingly difficult year. And that's because in the second year, what the seminary, at least that seminary was designed to do, was to... Was to um, <laughs> break you down, make you aware of the baggage you bring to the table. And the reason for that is, is that if you actually want to be helpful to someone who comes to you, you must be aware of yourself. You must be aware of the baggage you bring to the table because if you're not aware of the stuff you bring, you end up not helping the other person. You end up helping yourself. And you don't help them at all. You must know who you are. And um, there, there is not one of us, because of the broken world that we live in, that doesn't come to the table with our own baggage and sometimes an awful lot of it. And we're pretty sure we're 100%. Uh, and yet, when you go through that kind of level of, of serious counseling and all, you find out. And it was an agonizing year. But when you come back together, when, when you get it in place, you always come back at a higher level of functioning. It is absolutely necessary to grow. But because it's agonizing, few people will do it. Because ministry is hard, many people who step out a half step or a full step or a couple of steps, um, end up laying the ministry down because it's hard. Somewhere we still have the notion that the ministry in, in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ is easy and it's not. we got to put that to bed at some point. We have to acknowledge that if serving the Lord Jesus Christ is countercultural, it'll always be hard. There'll be a lot of times where it's frustrating. And if we want to do it over the long haul and not give up way before we should, we better learn to know ourselves. And maybe the place that we begin is by taking a look at Elijah, who understands this clearly. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no longer better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. One of the things where I think most of us are most lax is in knowing ourselves so that we actually lead ourselves. Few people... Uh, understand why they really do the things they do. They think they've made decisions. They think this is why they're gone, some particular place or whatever. But the truth of the matter is, if we haven't taken the time to clearly understand ourselves, then we most likely are being driven by the culture around us. And the, and the truth is in the pudding. Most people, if you pin them down, pin them down hard, don't give them room to escape, um, they can't tell you 
why I do the things I do, why I'm where I'm at, why what has happened has happened. Uh, they really think they were bold and it's all because of their own leadership. The truth of the matter is they were driven by the culture, cannot give reason behind it. And if you don't know clearly yourself and the motivations for your ministry, it won't, it won't last over the long haul. I know the story of Elijah personally. I know what it's like to say, I have had enough. Lord, I'm no better than my ancestors. He's, you know what he's saying there, right? I'm dead already. That's what he's saying. I'm already dead. And it's an interesting thing to, to just look at the backstory a little bit. You might wonder why he's there. You know that hopefully you know the story of Elijah. If you don't, I'm just going to give you a real quick, real quick overview, okay? This section of scripture takes place just after Elijah has had an incredible day. It's a story about all the prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Baal out there teaching the people wrong stuff and saying that Baal is the God and the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is not the right God, that Elijah is wrong. And Elijah says, hey, you know what? Let's, let's get together and have a little contest. He says, what we'll do is, is we'll take an oxen, we'll cut it in half and offer it up as, as a sacrifice to God. Um, you, you cut it in half, you offer it up to the God of Baal, and I'll cut it in half, I'll offer it up to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we'll see whose God's really real. And so the story goes that all day long, all day long, the prophets of Baal, they're out there, they're praying, they're, they're crying, they're cutting themselves, they're doing all kinds of things in order to seek the good pleasure of the God of Baal all day long, and nothing happens. And so when it's Elijah's turn, he says, all right, lay the oxen out there. Now, before you start, dig a little trench around that and go get water, buckets of water. Pour it all over. Pour it over the wood, over the rocks, over the, uh, over the oxen that has been sacrificed. Pour it. Just make it wet. And I'll pray to God. So he prays to God. And the story tells us that the fire of God, the all-consuming fire of God came down and consumed the oxen consumed the wood, consumed the rocks, and it even lapped up and consumed the water around about. And he said to the people then, you know that God is God. These people are, are evil, and, and 400 prophets of Baal were, were killed that day. And I look at that story, and I think, wow, that's pretty successful. How about you? You think that was a successful day for him? And then story, the word gets to him that the queen, Jezebel, doesn't like at all what he's done and says, by the end of the day, I'm going to have you killed. Now, he's just done an enormous thing, an incredible thing. He gets news from Jezebel, and he runs. I've had enough. He runs. He runs and he says, I'm the only one left. I've worked hard. I've struggled. I've worked hard and no one seems to listen. I am the only one left that serves you, God. I'm done. Take my life. I'm no better than my dead ancestors. And the way we do ministry in our world, the way it has turned out is, I know that feeling. Because we live in a world where, I talked about accountability a couple of weeks ago, and few of us have anything that holds us accountable in our faith, anything to look, any gauge whatsoever, but I'm held accountable by, by all of everybody, 300, 400 people. And we will, and it has happened plenty of times, hold the pastor accountable for something we do regularly in our own lives. 
and it feels like sometimes, Lord, I've had enough. I'm the only one. These people don't get it. We wrap ourselves in the cloak of righteousness and attack somebody different. I love the story, if you go read it. I didn't mention this before, I should have. Actually, what happens is <laughs> God straightens Elijah out a little bit and says, um, you poor soul, there are yet 7,000 people who have not bent their knee to Baal. But the issue that I'm talking about is, is that Elijah got there because he hadn't done the work necessary. He hadn't um, gone internal. He himself didn't recognize of himself that he could get worn out. That he himself um, uh, could get to a place where he could um, actually believe something that wasn't true. If you want a fruitful ministry over the long haul, it is absolutely imperative that we understand the Elijah story personally because I believe many of us actually, if we've been serious about our faith, many of us have had the same experience. Been very serious about serving the Lord. Uh, actually volunteered over and over again and turn around and look and, and the same people volunteer and some people never seem to be a part of it. It's easy to say, you know what? Um, I've had enough. I seem to be one of the ones doing all the work and a lot of people just are always never able to do it. But knowing yourself means spending enough time to understand who I am as a person of Jesus Christ. And the reason I step into ministry is because I serve that same Lord Jesus Christ whether anyone else does or not. It's not about someone else anyway. It's about me before my own God. We've all, many of us, I should say all, many of us I think have been here who've worked hard, who wanted to do what was good and just couldn't see the outcome or couldn't see the results. But it's imperative that we spend that time before Almighty God understanding ourselves, understanding um, how our ministry we talked about before plugs into that, that God-sized ministry of the Church of Jesus Christ, how I am part of that, how what I'm doing is bigger than me so that I understand who I'm serving, what I'm doing. And it's not about me, it's about the ministry to Almighty God. Paul helps a little bit here. Let's listen to um, Paul. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food. You were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, Another, I follow Apollos. Are you not mere human beings? What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you, can, you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Here's the truth. Here's a real truth. Fruitfulness is finally in the hands of God. Salvation's in the hands of God. Coming to understand who I am as a sinful person is a work of the divine God through the Holy Spirit. My confessing my sins to accept Christ into my heart is not my work, it is a work of the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, issues of spirituality are in the hands of God. But to say that, to understand that, to say that ultimately this is a work of God is not an excuse to not step out in ministry because the task has been assigned to us. We are a part of this overall ministry. If in fact the final product is the product of the divine God, we have been at least called into that to be part of it so that it comes to fruition. And what we have been called to do then is to plant. And here's, here's the real issue about planting. If you have a field and you dream 
in your mind about having a harvest. You want to, uh, you want to have a, uh, an, a, a, an apple orchard. And you think about it, and, and it seems to be what you want to do. But if you have that large field and you want to have an apple orchard, and all you do is sit in your house and pray about having an apple orchard, I want to ask you a question. Will you ever have an apple orchard? Why not? Because you didn't play in it. So if you have this field and you're sitting in your house and you have been praying for an apple orchard, but you didn't go out and get saplings and put them in the ground, you will never have an apple orchard. It won't just happen. And we have been called into the ministry of making disciples, every one of us. But the same, the exact same is true is if all we do is sit in our houses or just even come to our churches, if you will, and pray that a disciple will be made, but we don't actually go out about planting, then it'll never happen either. It's exactly the same thing. And we all have been called into that. That's the, that's the thing we all want to deny because it's hard. Is that we all, according to Christ, have been told to go out into the world and make disciples in the name of Jesus Christ. But you've got to plant that sapling in order for it to grow. And even you've got to have some kind of image in your head of what that orchard will finally ultimately look like. But it takes some steps. Once you plant those saplings, you must water them. And you, we all know that. We all know enough about plants. Any new plant you put in the ground needs to be watered, doesn't it? It needs to be watered really well at the beginning for a period of time. And you can't trust Mother Nature, I'm going to put it in the ground and, and, and I'll let it rain, you know. When you put a new sapling in the ground, when you put a new plant in the ground, rarely does it rain enough for those roots to take hold. Even if it's raining, even if other people are watering, um, that doesn't mean it'll get enough water. We need to plant, we need to water when it is growing. And we need to uh, understand that, that it takes Effort. It takes our effort. It takes effort day in and day out to have planted, to now water, to nurture that orchard so that it will produce fruit. But here's the difficulty. And anybody who's planted anything like an apple tree or a pear tree or a peach tree, do you get fruit the next year? Three to five years, depending on the kind of tree you plant, whether it's one of those it takes three to five years of caring, pruning, watering, fertilizing in order for that tree to produce some fruit. And it's the same thing with those to whom we are interacting with in the world. It, it probably is not going to happen overnight or over uh, even a week or a couple of weeks. It might take years of our willingness to understand what that growing Christian looks like and to order our entire life in a way that we might actually be making disciples, that we might be part of a fruitful harvest individually and corporately in the church of Jesus Christ. And those who study it say we are in a time where it's taking longer than in any period in our history because people are being more critical as they look at us and understand us before they might want to say, you know what, I want to be a part of what you have in your heart and in your life as well. we we got to be willing uh, to be like that owner of this orchard, to work at it and work at it hard over the course of a lot of years. When I first came here, I wanted to start a class for people then my age, quite young. Not people my age now, quite old, quite young, you know, when I started class. And, and um, I studied and prepared a lesson, a whole, and studied weekly, ready to give a, a, a lesson. And um, for a while, no one came any Sunday. 
and I was there, ready, if anybody came. Talked about it, talked, offered, talked all the time, nobody came. And then somebody showed up. I've been planning the idea, planning, planning, planning. Somebody showed up, began to water. And, and then it would be nobody, and then somebody, and then nobody, and then a couple bodies, and then nobody, and then three, and maybe the, and there was no Sunday when there was less than one, and it grew and grew into an, into a nice group, a group uh, that I, I, I just love teaching, I love to be a part of. It, it grew to where we dealt with a lot of issues. And I think, I, I said this earlier, I think maybe it's because I can be stubborn. And maybe we ought to call it being stubborn for the Lord. I decided I was going to be there over the long haul if no one ever came. I was going to be faithful. I don't care if anyone came. And a great class grew out of that. But here's what can happen. Here's what happens if you can't do ministry over the long haul. We started the second service, and I can't be a part of that class anymore. I can't be here and there. And no one, no one wanted that harvest from that orchard as bad as I did. And over the course of years, the watering didn't happen the way it needed, and it, it ended. That's the nature of, of both an orchard and ministry. It means effort all the time, continual, working hard, uh, knowing that you're working for the Lord, knowing that you're serving God, knowing that you're making a difference in lives, knowing that in some way you will be able to reach someone. And if you want to maintain your ministry over the long haul, you need to know something about that. There will be a lot of times when it doesn't feel like you're winning. There are a lot of times when it doesn't make you, you don't think you're making a difference. That was Elijah's issue. <clears throat> but it doesn't mean you give up when you, you don't think you're winning because God knows what we don't know. And God calls us into a faithfulness. God calls us to be faithful and God will use the faithfulness, but he can't use that which is not faithful. But in those real difficult times, and I think the church of, called United Methodism is in a real difficult time right now, we need to remember this, that ultimately God is in control. Ultimately, when you're sure you're the only one, God knows different. There are yet 7,000, 7,000 being a critical number, meaning the perfect number of people have never bent their knee to bail. And right now, when you're not sure, you are winning. God says to us, there are yet 7,000, that perfect number of followers, who are still worshiping me. And ultimately, and this one is helpful for me, ultimately, serving the Lord Jesus Christ is not really about the opaque future anyway. We can't see it. It is about the past. It is about the cross. It is about salvation. It is about um, God having already done that for you and I, freeing us up from the power of sin and death. It's not about the future and whether I'll be successful. It's about what God has already done and what I do as an act of thanksgiving for that.